The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, the Pacific Rift opens up and swallows the ocean. Oh, wait, that's tomorrow's news. Consciousness enhanced by hard drinking. Plus, we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of David Drake's The Sea Without a Shore. All right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain editor Tony Daniel. This time we have an interview with Les Johnson. Les talks about his new novel, co-authored with Travis S. Taylor, On to the Asteroid. It's a sort of a sequel to Back to the Moon that uh, was also by Travis and Les. Les is a space scientist, as is Travis, and the threat of destruction from the sky in this one is very believable. Asteroid mining is highly desirable in humanity's future, in my opinion, and many others, but we should probably be careful when we're driving the things, not to get into a wreck of planetary proportions. And we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of The Sea Without a Shore by David Drake. All coming up, here's the news. The new free fiction and non-fiction is now available at the Bain.com front page. First, we continue each week with our great serialization of Apocalypse, an epic poem by Frederick Turner. I really want to commend this to you. It's a good story, and there are some singing turns of phrase in it. Fred is a nationally renowned poet specializing in traditional forms, and heck, it's a science fiction story told in the tradition of Homer, Virgil, and Milton. Give it a try. Also now available is Bringer of Light by David Carrico. For as long as Vikram Banerjee can remember, the alien Jow have ruled the earth. Just four years old when the invasion began, Vikram has grown up hating the alien overlords. But now something has changed. The Ekkat, once thought to be nothing more than a Jow myth, have launched an attack on earth. And the Ekkat are far worse than the Jow. Now Vikram must make a choice. Let years of anger and blind hatred rule his life, or choose a nobler path. This story is set in the world of the Jow Empire series, created by Eric Flint. The first two books were written by Eric and Katie Wentworth, and now the series continues with The Span of Empire by Eric Flint and David Carrico, out in September. Also at the website is A Quantum of Consciousness, which is a really compelling essay about finding a quantum mechanism that might facilitate or even create consciousness in human beings. This is by Bain author and esteemed biologist John Lampshead. Along the way, John does a pretty good job of demolishing algorithmic and reductionist arguments for the phenomenon of consciousness. This one will make you think about what makes you think. Apocalypse by Frederick Turner, Bringer of Light by David Carrico, and A Quantum of Consciousness by John Lambshead are all available at Bain.com, and then the essay will become part of the free nonfiction 2016 ebook at Bain eBooks, and the fiction will go into Free Short Stories 2016 at Bain eBooks. Meanwhile, Fred Turner's epic poem serialization will continue with new sections weekly. I want to welcome Les Johnson to the podcast. Hey, Les. Hey, Tony. Thanks for having me. Les Johnson is a space scientist. He is one of the founders and a driving force behind the acclaimed science gathering, the Tennessee Valley Interstellar Workshop. He's senior technologist for the Advanced Concepts Office at the NASA George C. Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville. Uh, Les is also a solar sail expert and is engaged in implementing solar sail technology on a satellite that is currently under construction. might ask you a little bit about how that's going soon. Um, Les can frequently be seen in interviews on the Nat Geo channel and elsewhere. For Bain, Les is the co-author along with Ben Bova of Mars mission book Rescue Mode. He's the editor of Bain Science and Science Fiction Anthology Going in Interstellar, one of the co-editors, and he's the author of many, many science articles for the Bain.com website for which we are eternally grateful. 
and we love them. And with Travis S. Taylor, Les is the author of Near Future Space Based Thriller Back to the Moon. Now, On to the Asteroid by Travis S. Taylor and Les Johnson is at booksellers everywhere. So, uh, Les, you know something about asteroids, I think. Enormous potential to enrich or destroy humanity. Um, Earth has been hit by, in, within living memory of the human race, Earth has been hit by something very large, hasn't it? Well, we get hit all the time. Most of them are very small. Uh, there are a lot of people out there today that, that go collect meteorites. And, uh, in fact, if you go to some place like the Antarctic, that's, that's almost heaven for these meteorite hunters because on that ice sheet, if you see a little rock sitting on the top of the ice, where else could it have come from, right? Mm -hmm. But that's where they go and find a, a lot of these. So we're hit all the time. There's tons of space dust that comes in, lots of little rocks. But fortunately, it's very, very rare for anything very big to, to, to come in. But, but we have been hit, uh, sort of. The atmosphere has been hit in, in recent memory, right? There was the, uh, the Chebolinsk meteor in uh, 2013 that was an airburst mm -hmm. had a uh, a pretty big rock coming in at, at at for for you and me i mean this is just amazing to think about something that big coming in at 40,000 miles per hour but that's about how fast it was moving and when it when it entered the atmosphere it heated up really fast and it exploded at about a 30 kilometer altitude which is the equivalent of like 20 hiroshima bombs going off it was it was just just huge if that gotten closer to the ground would have done a lot more damage than it did. And then, of course, there was the, the big event back in 1908, also in Russia. I, I guess they might feel like they're in the bullseye, but if you're a big country, I guess that uh, means you're a bigger target, right? Mm -hmm. The Tunguska event back in 1908, which was estimated to be about the equivalent of an airburst of a five megaton explosion. So, yeah, it's pretty pretty dicey, and, and events like that happen pretty much every hundred years. And and this, these last two events were about 100 years apart, so the statistics is, is kind of bearing fruit, but it could happen again tomorrow. There are a lot of these rocks out there. Yeah. The potential energy that's that's coming in with with one of those, I mean, 40,000 miles an hour, what does a bullet go, maybe 2,000? Uh, I'm not sure what the fastest bullet is, but it's far less than that. That's probably about right. And uh, it, it's just incredible. I mean, the orbital velocity traveling around the solar system is just really, really high, and uh, it's a big game of billiards. And if we happen to get in the way of one of these rocks, it, it, it's pretty bad. But the good thing is most of these won't come anywhere close to hitting us. In fact, as we've, we've done more and more over the last 10 years or so, uh, uh, radar studies and surveys of, of the near solar system, we have found thousands and thousands of new asteroids, small ones and big ones, that are circling the sun fairly close to the Earth's orbit, but the probability of them hitting us is, is just really, really small. So it's not, in general, a threat we have to worry about every day. Now, there are a few that come pretty close over the next several hundred years that we have to watch closely because we don't know exactly where their, what their orbits are like and we need to watch them. But there, there's no impending threat, I think, of anything that's like an extinction-level event, thankfully. Speaking of extinction-level events... Um yeah. Since we don't have any dinosaur journalists around to give us the lowdown of what that was, can you tell us um, <laughs> what an asteroid strike on Earth might look like, um, what the effects might be? I think in Onto the Asteroid, that's even, it's it's not a dinosaur level uh, size asteroid, is it, or is it? No, no, it's not. Um, and, and that's what makes it all the scarier, in my opinion and that, th that we know, looking out into the solar system right now, that there are very, very few really big things, size of a mountain or bigger size asteroids that are going to come close to the Earth that could wipe us out, thankfully. We've got a pretty good map of those. But there are a lot of these smaller ones that may not be extinction-level events, but if they were to hit, it could be really bad. And e even these ones that I've mentioned, like Tunguska and um, Chebolinsk, you know, imagine what would have happened if the Chebolinsk meteor had, had come in over a major Russian city at the height of the Cold War, right? I mean, that could have triggered a nuclear war. So even a, a small rock like that going off in the atmosphere at the wrong place at the wrong time could have devastating consequences. Some of these that, that are bigger, a little bit bigger so that they don't blow up before they reach the ground, but actually reach the ground, you know, obviously wherever they hit, it's a bad day for everybody there. It'd be like a nuclear bomb going off in a city. 
But if one of those were to hit in the ocean, it could be even worse. I don't know if your uh, listeners, some of your listeners may have seen the movie Deep Impact. Mm-hmm. And that's, uh, that's one of my favorite of the asteroid strike movies that have been out there. But it showed a pretty realistic, in my estimation, uh, assessment of what would happen if one of these hit off the coast in the ocean and the tsunami that would result in the destruction that would come from that. It would make, you know, the tsunami off Japan a few years ago, you know, look pretty small by comparison. So these rocks don't have to be huge to do a lot of damage. And the bigger they are, the more damage they can, they can do. So uh, those dinosaur reporters, and as Travis, I think, says in, in his afterward to the book, you know, they didn't have a space program to look out and say, uh-oh, <laughs> we, what's coming, we better do something about this. And we do. I just hope we would have the, the forethought and the quickness of response to be able to go take care of it and stop that from happening. And, and I think we can, because I believe we're going to be out there mining asteroids. So tell us about the mining asteroids. There's a reason the asteroid in the book is called Suter's Mill. What have rocks in space got that we might want or need? Well, the, the Earth, the current thinking is that it was formed from the, 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 the dirt and dust that was forming the sun when the sun first came together, and those collisions happened enough that finally you got an object that had enough gravity that more and more junk was pulled into it and it formed the Earth when it, when it cooled down. But all of the stuff from which we're made is the same stuff that these asteroids are made out of. So just about any material you find in the Earth's crust is available out there waiting to be taken and grabbed in space. I mean, platinum, phosphorus, zinc, indium, silver, and and probably the most precious resource for space exploration, which is water. Uh, Comets and and asteroids appear to be pretty rich in water. So you you have the stuff that you need... um, not only for bringing potentially back here to feed our industry in the future, but in the in the nearer term to feed a space-based industry, and and so I, I I applaud these small businesses that are out there that are looking at at how you use these resources right now because I think it's it's one of the next logical steps of of developing space. So the answer is just about anything you can think of that you can find on the Earth, you can find out there. Yet. Um... In your book, the asteroid is not a uh, accidental menace. Um, is the risk of an asteroid strike? Um, well, I assume if you're you're trying to get one into Earth orbit, the chance that it might mess up is there, right? It is. It is, and that's a concern. And and I think that I, I don't want readers of our book to think that we're not in favor of asteroid mining because absolutely we're in favor of it. But like any other endeavor that we humans do, you've got to look at the potential consequences if something goes wrong before you do it. And it's just good. It's a part of good planning and a good part of, of uh, risk mitigation. And that's what so, you do in the book. <laughs> that's exactly right. In, in that if you're going to move one of these asteroids, you better darn well know <laughs> not only what's going to happen if it goes well, but you got to make sure that there is no failure mode that would be a bad day for anybody anywhere, right? So uh, my, my, our story is along the lines of, uh, of one of these private companies that is moving an asteroid to make it more accessible for mining so they can go do what they want to do and, and sell resources, and I think that's great. But they were too bullish in terms of assuming that what they were going to do was we're going to work perfectly and hadn't adequately looked at all the failure modes. And uh, there was a, a failure at a critical moment, which puts the asteroid on a course they don't want it to be on. And that's something that I would hope people planning these things would take into account. But, you know, I, I envision a future where you have not just the current space players, the U.S., Russia, Japan, Europe, out there mining asteroids, but perhaps just about anybody on the planet who has the ability to go to space going and doing that. And when you have that many people out there competing and doing these things, the likelihood of a mistake is there. Mm. Well, I thought, I mean, some of the uh, some of the ideas of how they they did the mining were really cool, like the uh, tether idea to stop the asteroid rotation. Um, how how would that work? What's the problem with asteroids rotating anyway? Well, um, everything in space is moving. Not only is it moving around the sun with essentially like the Earth's orbital velocity, where we circle, you know, every every year, which is what defines a year. But 
rocks are spinning, and the bigger rocks that are further away from the sun uh, tend to have rotation rates of anywhere from uh, a few degrees per second, maybe all the way up to much more than that. So if you're going to mine them, and especially if you're going to try to move them with some kind of a thruster where you want to push them in a certain direction, you, you typically would think about stopping the rotation so that you can accurately point the asteroid and thrust it in the direction you want to go. There are various ideas for uh, moving asteroids that have been proposed, and some of which involve, like we have in the book, putting some kind of a thruster on the rock. But if you're going to do that, you have to know how to steer and point in the direction you want to go, and that doesn't work very well if it's rotating. So in the book, we have our uh, uh, company take out these big, long cables with masses on the end that they deploy out from the rock, and slow it down so that it no longer spins, and then they cut uh, the uh, the cables to 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 get them out of the way, and the rock has stopped rotating. The best way to to describe that effect it's called conservation of angular momentum. And if you look at ice skaters, uh, I know we're in the middle of the Summer Olympics, but if you think about the Winter Olympics, and you have the skaters out on the ice, and they're doing their spin, and they pull their arms in close, and they spin faster, and if they extend their arms out, they slow down. What's well, exactly the same principle, and instead of the uh, ice skater, it's the asteroid spinning, and instead of uh, his or her arms being extended, it's the big long cables with weights on the end, and as they're extended, the rotation rate of the rock slows down until it eventually stops. And so that was the idea that we put forth in the in the book. Mm. So, all right, this thing is headed toward us. Something might go wrong and does. What are the options? Um, why won't the stuff we see in the movies work, or, or will it? Well, some of it might. Uh, the first thing people think of is, oh, let's just go nuke it. And, and that's probably, for a lot of reasons, not your best first reaction. In the first place, if, if something's coming at you and you haven't gone and surveyed it to know exactly what it is, or if you don't have really good pictures with a telescope or otherwise, you don't know if it's one big rock or if it's a whole bunch of smaller rocks that are what's called loosely gravitationally bound. And basically that means they're small, but there's enough gravity from each of them and a little bit of stiction so they stay clumped together, but it's like a, like a dirt clod. And if, if you send a nuclear weapon out to that dirt clod, instead of diverting it with, uh, by exploding the bomb, and I'll talk about the problems with that in a minute, you might blow the dirt clod apart. And then instead of one big rock coming in, you've got three to 20 or more smaller rocks coming in. And instead of, you know, th think of it as a, a combat situation. Somebody's shooting at you. You know, do you want to take a bullet or do you want to take a shotgun blast? So the, that, that question has to be asked. And so you want to make darn sure you know what you're doing before you send out that nuke because you, you don't want to turn this into a shotgun blast. And, and the other thing is when you send the nuke out there, you're not really blowing it up. We can't build a weapon big enough to blow up one of these big rocks the way we want to do it. What, what we would do is we'd explode it so that the radiation burns off and ablates part of the asteroid. And as that burns off, it gives it a nudge. It's like it's turning it into a rocket. Uh, just to remind your listeners, a rocket is, you know, I, I throw hot gas in one direction and my rocket moves in the other direction. Well, if you explode a nuclear weapon in front of one of these rocks, you burn off layers of rock and that boils off out into space, and to conserve angular momentum, the rock has to recoil and move the other way. And so you could do that, um, but it's not really blowing up the rock, and what it's doing is it's changing its velocity so that it and the Earth would not necessarily be in the same place at the same time like they were going to be previously. So maybe it slows it down enough that the Earth moves through this region of space and the asteroid comes by you know, a few seconds or minutes later and misses us. But there are so many unknowns with the nuke that I, I would never do that as a first choice. Um, there are lots of other things you can do. I, one of my favorites is something we didn't put in the book. It's called a gravity tractor. And that idea is if you have uh, 10 years notice, just pulling that number randomly, could be three, eight, not much less than three, and you send a spacecraft out there to fly next to it that has a thruster on it, the little teeny spacecraft will slightly tug on the asteroid, just like the asteroid is slightly tugging on the spacecraft. And that little tug over a long period of time as the, asteroid, as the spacecraft is thrusting its, its, its electric thrusters or whatever would just nudge the asteroid's velocity enough that, again, it would miss the Earth. 
And it, it's a very undramatic approach, but it, it's one that looks like a pretty benign approach to altering their trajectories. Now, what we have in the book is we have a very efficient, long-duration thruster called an electric propulsion system that we put on the surface of the of the asteroid, and essentially it gives it a slow but constant push over weeks or months that changes its speed. So there are lots of ways you could do this. Uh, even my favorite, right, solar sails, make a big mirror and reflect sunlight to boil off part of the asteroid. And, and, and as that boil off bounces from it, again, it's giving it a nudge and changing its speed. So there are lots of ways we could, we could do this to put it where you want to put it, it's just the hard part probably won't be the, the, the adjusting its orbit. It'll be adjusting its, its orbit around the sun to put it where you want to put it, which is, again, part of the problem in, onto the asteroid. You describe in the book the, um, the way that um, an electric propulsion system like you have in the book would look, which is a lot different than a chemical rocket. What, what is the reaction mass that it's pushing out? What, what is making it work well typically it typically is is a heavy gas like uh one of the noble gases like argon or xenon and you have a tank of that uh, the reason that an electric propulsion system is attractive is because of its efficiency you get about 10 times the amount of thrust per pound of propellant from an electric propulsion of not thrust i mean restate that you get about 10 times the amount of, of uh, total change in velocity of whatever it is you're moving when you use an electric system versus a chemical rocket. It's just that much more efficient per pound of fuel. A chemical rocket gives you high thrust. You know when that thing's lit up. You feel it. It pushes you back in your chair if you're on a rocket that does that, and it burns all its fuel in 10 minutes, and then you coast for years. Whereas electric propulsion systems are just a little gentle nudge as they work that you probably wouldn't even notice, but they burn for years, potentially, and give you a total velocity change that's much higher than an equivalent amount of fuel on a chemical rocket would be able to give you. And so we put that in the book because it's it's a low thrust very efficient system they weren't really in a hurry to move this they had a plan of just slowly nudging it across but of course something stops working before that gets completely moved and puts it on a course they don't want it to be on well tell us a little bit about the near future y'all have constructed in the book um there's significant more infrastructure um in earth orbit and on the moon uh is it technologically advanced to the point where um, it, they are able to do things we can't now? Or just, just describe the future you've got going. Well, you know, what's depressing to me, Tony, is that everything we describe in this book we could do today, period, mm -hmm. end of story. It's, it's, it's just a matter of priorities and whether people want to do it. And uh, we are postulating in the book that not only – are the world space agencies going to continue moving forward with sending humans beyond Earth orbit and exploring deep space, going back to the moon or going on to Mars, but that you've got a vibrant private space industry, that you have private companies doing exactly what companies like SpaceX and Blue Origin and Bigelow are doing today. They're, they're building rockets that they want to take, use to take tourists into space. Uh, people are talking about, in, in the book, they're putting hotel on the moon for wealthy people to go vacation in, Earth orbit destinations for for tourists all this is doable today i mean there's no reason it, it couldn't be done now so this infrastructure that we have in place is an infrastructure that i personally believe i could see in the next 10 to 12 to 15 years at the rate that things are progressing with with hotels and tourism and uh actually beginning deep space travel with humans again so we're, we're being a bit optimistic in that we're, we're saying this is going to be the mid-2020s. might actually be 30 or, you know, 20, 30 before it all happens. But it's doable. There's no, you know, this, this science fiction that Travis and I write is not science fiction that pulls some MacGuffin out that solves all the problems. It's, it's you know, what can we really do? And we, we envision a future we'd like to see and we think is possible, except, of course, for the big rock coming toward us. <laughs> I'd rather avoid that one if I can. Yeah. 
Let's talk more about the um, the characters in the book. Um, I believe that uh, we saw them last in Back to the Moon. Uh, tell us about Paul Gessling, our our main character. Well, one of the things that I get asked a lot is, you know, where do these characters come from? Well, a little secret here is my mother's maiden name was Gessling. And uh, that, that side of the family tend to be uh, very tall people, very, very tall, their German ancestry. And so uh, the hero of the book is uh, Paul Gessling, and there's no family member that I know of named Paul. But uh, he's an ex-Navy pilot, uh, wanted to be an astronaut, but he was actually too tall. And it's, it's uh, NASA and other uh, space agencies kind of like the, quote, statistically average human, right? <laughs> he was too big. I guess that might have been an excuse. I don't know what it was, that he didn't get into being an astronaut for NASA. So he does what he thinks is the next best thing, which is probably a really good thing. And he goes to work for one of these private space businesses and becomes their chief pilot. Uh, he got to uh, go to the moon, uh, around the moon, and back to the moon, uh, the, that novel. And in this one, he is, uh, at the beginning of the book, uh, returning to the moon himself to test out that hotel that's there, and he ends up being a key character in the uh, resolution of the crisis. So, what, you know, pe- people say you write about what you know. I guess for me, uh, Paul Gessling is the uncle or the cousin that I wish I had <laughs> who was going to be flying these kinds of missions, and uh, that's that's where he, he came from. That's cool. Paul has to make a – I mean, there's some dire stuff going on in the book since it is a thriller. Um Paul has to make a, a gut-wrenching decision to leave his injured r- wife behind. This is kind of, it's symbolic in a way of, um, or, or, or an example epitomized of, of the way that long-range space explorers, the sort of problems they might face if they, if they have to leave family behind because you can't get back until you're ready to come back, right? That's right. And, and that's something I have wondered about because, again, I get asked the question, Frequently, less it could. Would you go to Mars? Uh, assuming it's not a one-way trip, um, and my answer is always kind of hedgy answer, in that that would be not only all the training that leads up to that and the commitment that entails, but that would be saying goodbye to your family and friends and everything on the planet for three years to go there and come back, and a lot can happen in three years. I mean, just think in your own life, things that have happened in the last three years, in your family and friends and tri- crises that have come up that you may have helped intervene in or help solve or otherwise. So it's a huge commitment, and it takes somebody pretty special to put the, the, the needs of the future ahead of their immediate family needs. And I think that would be really, really hard to do. And we, we had Paul make that decision because he's the right guy to work with the other characters in the book to, to go do this diversion. And it, it involves leaving his critically injured wife uh, because her fate is unknown when he leaves, kind of wrenched with guilt as he's out there wondering what the heck is going on at home. So, yeah, you're absolutely right. These, these men and women who are going to undertake these deep space missions, it's, it's going to be a huge personal sacrifice. We have other... Um it ends up being uh, a Russian and a Chinese astronaut who are accompanying him. Um, tell us about Hugh. Who is who, Hugh? Then? Well, well, I really like her. She's a character that kind of came alive uh, for me in Back to the Moon. She was the uh, commander of the Chinese uh, lunar mission that crash-landed on the moon in Back to the Moon. And when we first started writing her character, uh, we weren't sure how she was going to turn out, whether she'd be the uh, collaborative type who was going to be grateful for somebody coming along to help them get out of their predicament, or whether she was going to be ultra-nationalist and, and cold. And as it turns out, her character actually warmed up to be one of somebody who uh, really wants to do the right thing for humanity and is driven by the same dreams and aspirations that many of us are that work on the space exploration. Why should someone from China be any different, right? So in the spirit of, of um, helping to stop this, this uh, disaster that's pending for the planet, the, the crew that assembles is a crew that in large part have worked together before because Paul and, and Hugh had to work together on the back to the moon to get everybody back home safely at some level. And it just seemed natural to have her come and, and be a part of this uh, part of this trip because she had the experience and represented a country that has a lot at stake in space mining and in averting a disaster, which is, is China. 
So she, she, uh, I really like that character. She's very sympathetic. Um, and our, uh, our Russian is, uh, he's a different sort of fellow, but he's also, um, he's an engineer for one thing. Is it Mikhail? In my mind, he's, yeah, Mikhail, he's an engineer's engineer. And, and I use that term in my day job when, with some of the people that I work with who are good engineers. And then there are people who not only spend their day doing engineering on spacecraft for NASA or elsewhere, they go home and they're inventing things in their garage and they're fixing everything mechanical or electronic that breaks down in their home and rewiring things for fun and making things happen. And that's who Mikhail is. He's what I call an engineer's engineer. He's he's the kind of person, you know, can't see anything mechanical or electrical and not try to figure out how to improve it and make it better and fix it. So, yeah, that's exactly what he is. And, and these guys have to spend months together because this is not just a trip to the moon. This is a rather long journey. There's um, You brought up in rescue mode some of the psychological challenges of, of um, a trip like that. No, absolutely. Uh, I, I firmly believe that we've got most of the technical challenges solved. I think the, the biggest unknown for long-duration spaceflight is going to be those very people who are being separated from their families and, and are out there. I mean, the way I describe it is uh, you and your two or three best friends, in this case, for this book, go get yourself a Winnebago, and instead of driving to California and taking a two-week cross-country trip together where you finally get there and you're thinking, oh, my gosh, I'll be glad when this is over so these my friends can go back to being my friends and I don't get mad at them every day after being trapped in this Winnebago with them. But you lock them up for months, if not a year, with instant death on the outside of the walls of that Winnebago, and imagine how the relationships will evolve. And and that's what I think these, these folks are going to be stressed out by on these trips. And, and I think we're the weak link, really. And a lot of my colleagues kind of get mad at me for saying that, but it, I think it's true. I think the technical we can solve, it's it's us. You know, we, how do we get ourselves so that we can survive? And one of the things that we found in, in this book is that this was a very compatible crew and, they, and, and what was compatible about it is they were all very professional. Uh, Paul had family at home that he was thinking about. Uh, Hugh was, was, was doing things for her country and as a follow-up, and she's very nationalistic and very driven for space development. And they didn't have the sexual tension, I think, that would, that would, would be a part of some other trips. So we touch on it, but we don't really, you know, make it a big deal in the book. So, yeah, it's, it's, that's the hard part. And the spaceship... Um it becomes a bit of a character itself. Um, tell us about the Tamaroa. Is that its name? That is its name, and and that comes from from history. Uh, d during World War II, there was a, a ship named Tamaroa. It was named after a Native American tribe by that name, and it saw action throughout World War II. And after the war, it was uh, retired from uh, that branch of the service and given to the Coast Guard, and it became a uh, rescue ship for the Coast Guard, hence the name of a rescue ship in our book, to go effect this rescue and save the planet, essentially. And if your uh, listeners are interested in history, it was uh, the first ship to arrive at the sinking Andrea Doria, and it was uh, the ship that was featured in the book, and the, based on the true story, The Perfect Storm, mm -hmm. was the ship that rescued some of the people that were uh, on the yacht uh, and the helicopter crew that crashed out in the Atlantic during the uh, major storm that's depicted in that book. So this, the, the real Tamaroa has a very storied history of rescue and uh, saving people and averting disasters. Uh, and that's why we named our ship the Tamaroa, was to honor the, uh, the history of that ship. I love the image of it's kind of, it, it inflates. That's how it gets made. Um... So metal is not the only substance that that can keep us safe in space. What 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 are the what does this thing look like, the Tamaroa? Well, I mean, uh, to, to, the best way I think of it is it's going to have some segments that, that are metal because you have to package everything. But if you're if you're flying something in space, you have to think about two two big things to get it from the ground up there. One is you, you want to have as much volume as you can for your crew to move around in and not be cramped and to hold all the equipment that you have to have go up with it. But you can't launch things that are big volume because we don't have launch vehicles that are basically big enough to launch huge 
you know, f surf volume structures like a house. So you have to break it into small parts. Well, if you break it into small parts, you have to assemble it in orbit, like we did the space station, and that takes a lot of crew time, and it's pretty complicated to do. We know how to do it, but it's hard. Or you could launch it and have something that inflates and gets bigger once you put it into space and put pressure in it. And NASA's actually doing that now with the BEAM, which is uh, an inflatable module that's on the space station. And uh, Bigelow Aerospace who is one of the companies looking at putting hotels in space, has done that a couple of times in Earth orbit with some subscale demonstrators, and they are building and prototyping now what they will have as one of their big space stations, which will be an inflatable structure. So it's a way to, to get more crew volume without adding a lot of volume at launch so you can package it, and it's also not necessarily as heavy. Uh, the risks are... It's, it's like a balloon, but not really. I mean, these things are thick-skinned. There are multiple layers to stop micrometeorites. You can design them so that if they get punctured, they can, for the most part, self-heal. Uh, the material can kind of, uh, any meteorite that hits it's going to make it hot. This stuff can flow easily around that to patch itself, and you could also have patch equipment in there if you get hit to do that. So this stuff's real. It's not science fiction. People are actually building it, flying it. There's some in space right now. And um, kind of an extension of, of what I used in uh, rescue mode as a Mars surface habitat. And, and you may have seen in the Martian, there was a, a kind of an inflated structure. This is the space equivalent of that. In the present day, um, what do you think needs to be done to protect Earth from, from what sounds like a real menace that could happen? And who might take on the task? What do you think the politics of this thing, this sort of thing would be? Well, I have to be careful here, and, and this is where I have to make my standard disclaimer. I do work for NASA, but I'm right for Bain as a private citizen, so all my, these opinions are strictly my own. Don't represent my employer what I think policy ought to be, right? So with that disclaimer firmly, firmly in mind, I, I think figuring out what the threat is is the first thing that needs to be done, and that's happening now. Uh, we, we have found and, and understand a lot more about what the population of these asteroids in the inner solar system are like than, than – we knew just 10 years ago. We know a lot more about where they are, how many they are, how many are Earth crossing, what the real threat is. What we don't know is that complete population. So there are smaller ones out there and other ones that might be on longer orbits that we haven't tracked yet. There's always the risk of something um, that's not a, an Earth, near the Earth in its orbit around the sun, but something more like a comet that comes from the outer solar system that might come in and cross paths with us that we don't see coming until late, which is pretty scary because you need a lot of lead time to be able to divert these things. So if, if someone were to make me czar of this whole thing, I would say do what we're doing, characterize the threat, understand what's out there, and I would say let's develop a system and have it on standby so that if there is a threat, we can go mitigate it. And it would go back to some of the ideas I mentioned earlier, the gravity tractor, the, the propulsion system that you attach to it to slowly bump it out of its way, out of its current path, um, something you, you impact with it called an impactor, which I didn't talk about, which is where you, you fire something really fast to smack into it and give it a jolt and give it a nudge to a different orbit. But have that on standby so that you can call it up, not in a moment's notice, but you know within a few months of detecting the threat, get it out there so that it could divert the asteroid. That's what I would do. Um, now, who has that responsibility? Currently, I don't think anybody does. Um, I, I know there have been meetings not only at the national level but at the UN, and there's a lot of discussion of who would do this on the, on, for, the for the Earth and who's going to say where it gets moved, right? In, in, uh, onto the asteroid, we have an asteroid that's deflected and looks like it's going to hit somewhere on the Earth. Well, you know, we're, we're pretty good at moving things around and figuring out how to get spacecraft where we want them to go. It is theoretically possible for someone to divert an asteroid and have it hit in a particular location on the Earth. So these asteroids could become weapons. So the question is, is it fair or is it right for any single country to go divert it when their self-interest could be, oh gosh, it's going to hit, let's make sure it doesn't hit our country, it hits the other guy's country. And is that good or bad? No, that's not good. So is the UN going to have jurisdiction? Is it going to be every country for themselves? Uh, which is a little bit of what you see in onto the asteroid because other another country does take it upon themselves to try to do something in addition to the international effort to divert it. 
So that's kind of where it stands. That's what I would do, is I would quickly get all these issues resolved as best I could and have some kind of a standby capability so that we don't get caught by surprise. Is there going to be a, I mean, can you foresee a future where Earth is orbited by these sort of moonlets that have been uh, diverted here and that we're mining? Maybe. It might be more likely that what we do is we have them orbiting uh, the moon, perhaps, in some of these interesting uh, uh, distant retrograde orbits, which is a particular kind of orbit that, that's not your typical circular kind of orbit around the moon. could also be that it's good enough that you have it so that the asteroid is orbiting the sun at a, at a distance not too different than the Earth orbits the sun, and every two year, every six months, you get close enough to it that the resources can easily be transferred back to the Earth or back to an Earth system infrastructure. You don't necessarily have to move them around the Earth. You could. So I, I think all it'll just depend on the asteroid and what it's being used for to determine what the best place to put it is. I don't think there's a pat answer for that. I, I envision all of that now that I have talked myself into it. Probably some around the moon, some in high Earth orbit, some just orbiting the sun that we visit regularly. Yeah. But none, hopefully, none hitting the Earth. <laughs> well, let's hope not. <laughs> The um, one other question about the different propulsion systems that I mean, you go through just about every kind of space propulsion in the book that there is, um, including the uh, the 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 thing that solves everything that we won't mention. But <laughs> yeah, so nuclear um, is something that that we might. That, a nu what is it? A nuclear electric system? That um, that. Oh, yeah. oh no! There are different. Yeah, like, yeah let's let's talk about that, uh, Tony. There are different. When you say nuclear, it could mean many things. I mean, with asteroids, most people think go blow a bomb up, but that's not necessarily the only thing you could do. Um, the, the, to move spacecraft around and to move an asteroid around the same way, you could use either the electric propulsion system I talked about earlier, and the key word there is electric. That means it has to have power. How does it get its power? Well, you can get some power from solar arrays and sunlight, but that's typically tens to maybe hundreds of kilowatts. What you might want is hundreds of kilowatts, if not megawatts, right? And to do that, you might need a nuclear reactor. So there are space, there are space propulsion systems that basically have small nuclear reactors driving these electric thrusters, like I talked about earlier. Then there's a type of nuclear propulsion system called nuclear thermal, which is what drives the Tamroa, because it was originally supposed to be a Mars mission. And it, it would use the nuclear energy to heat propellant like a chemical rocket and give you just a conventional you know, exhaust plume. But it's a more energetic exhaust plume that's about twice as efficient as a chemical rocket, so you cut the propellant load down by a, a factor of you know, 50%. So uh, there, when you say nuclear, you've got to be careful, because th there are three different types of nuclear you might think about for a scenario like this, where you could have somebody go blow up a bomb, you could have somebody attach a, a nuclear electric propulsion system to it, or use one of these nuclear thermal propulsion systems. And they're all very different in how they produce the effects. Mm -hmm. Well, you mentioned solar sails. Um is we just i mean chemical is why why do we use chemical rockets what's the necessary use for them well chemical rockets well one of the main reasons we use them is we we've used them we understand them and they're they're already developed and therefore inexpensive to use and and that's one of the conundrums with any technology is there are ways to do things better more efficiently but if you're only doing that for the first time it's more expensive and is it so much better that companies and people are willing to pay more money for the latest widget or is the widget in hand good enough right I mean you make that assessment when you decide whether or not you're going to replace your smartphone after a year probably not things haven't changed that much what you have is still good enough but three or four years down the road as other people have adopted and the cost comes down you might want to adopt that technology it's the same in, in, in thinking about chemical rockets they're really good. We understand how to use them in space, and there have been a few electric propulsion systems flown, some technology work on these nuclear systems, but your first user is going to bear the cost. So it comes down to, to cost. So why we use chemical in large part is we understand it, it's here, and it's cost-effective. 
there's really not much of a better way to get out of the Earth's gravity well than a chemical rocket. It's, it's inexpensive, relatively speaking. It's high thrust to counter the Earth's gravity. But once you get in space, you really don't care about gravity as much. What you care about is efficiency. And that's where I think we need to get away from chemical rockets and go to electric propulsion, solar sails, which use uh, reflected sunlight for nudging and moving things and, and propulsion. That's where I think we need to be using these nuclear thermal rockets, which are more efficient than chemical rockets. But early adopters are going to pay the cost for that. But it's happening. Slowly but surely, we're, we're starting to fly these things. Mm -hmm. So what are what are you working on at the moment? We're you know, we're going to see you on television anytime soon. Well, actually, yeah, there are a couple of uh, documentaries that are that are being filmed uh, that relate to my day job at NASA, primarily with the uh, solar sail work. Um, there was recently from the uh, uh, recent meeting of the Tennessee Valley Interstellar Workshop, not television, but a, a really nice uh, BBC documentary. On the radio that was that came out as a result of that. So if your listeners want to get that, it's on BBC Radio on interstellar travel. Uh, that was that was a lot of fun. Um, in terms of, of my writing, I'm working on my first. Uh, as you, your listeners may have looked at I like to co-author with people, but I'm working on my first solo novel for Ban. Yeah. Have a story that's going to go ahead. Yay. <laughs> I'm I'm really looking forward to that. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah, uh, I've got a short story that's coming out in a collection uh, in September. It uh, could be October. It's uh, called uh, uh, Science Fiction by Scientists. It's edited by uh, Mike Brotherton. That's coming out soon. And uh, I've also just sold a uh, – I just got a contract for a new uh, popular science book uh, with uh, Prometheus Books that will come out next year. So I'm still doing some of my science writing as well as uh, science fiction. Cool. And people can find you. I mean, if they go to your website, they can find things like your uh, your Ted Huntsville talk and and things like that. And they can. Oh, absolutely! Yeah, uh, www.lessjohnsonauthor.com. I try to keep uh, information up to date about my my books, some of the media appearances, where I'm going to be over the next year. I also have uh, upcoming appearances and such linked to my Amazon author page. And uh, some of the talks I've given are out there. I've, I'm going to be at a really fun event this uh, October in Kingsport, Tennessee. It's called Starfest. And if you're an amateur astronomer and want to go have a really good dark night viewing under the stars and be around people who like to do that kind of thing, it's going to be a gathering just outside of uh, Kingsport for that. I'll be talking about solar sailing and how we might actually go to some of these stars. Cool. Well, any other advice for saving humanity from destruction from uh, near-Earth uh, disasters? <laughs> I don't know. Join Mad Scientists Anonymous or something, right, and find out what the inside scoop is on what people are doing. I, now, I think the main thing is we, we just, uh, you know, you know, Tony, you and I have talked about this many times. We, we have a lot of problems that we're facing, but if you look at our history, we've overcome some of these problems, most of these problems. We've had heroic efforts against insurmountable odds. Think World War II and the Manhattan Project. And, and so if we get faced with a, a big challenge like uh, something that we propose and others have talked about in, like in, in our island of the asteroid or otherwise, you know, I, I'm really convinced there's almost no problem that's insolvable if we, we come together and, and make it happen. And I guess my advice for saving humanity is for people to quit being so darn pessimistic and look at all the good stuff that's happened and how much we can do and roll up our sleeves and quit bickering and go make some of it happen. That's my preaching to end. <laughs> All right, by God, I'm going to do it. Um, and everybody out there better do it. Uh, things are looking up. So the book is On to the Asteroid by Travis S. Taylor and Les Johnson. It's now available at booksellers everywhere. Les, thanks very much for being with us. Oh, thanks for having me, Tony. It's always a pleasure. Now we continue with our complete audiobook serialization of David Drake's The Sea Without a Shore. It seems Cinnabar's chief spymaster is a mother also, and her son is determined to search for treasure in the midst of a civil war. Who better to hold the boy's hand and to take the blows directed at him than Captain Daniel Leary, the Republic of Cinnabar Navy's troubleshooter, and his friend the cyberspy Adele Mundy. The only thing certain in the struggle for control 
of the mining planet Corsera is that the rival parties are more dangerous to their own allies than to their opponents. Daniel and Adele face kidnappers, pirates, and a death squad even before they can get to the real business of ending the war on Corsera and bringing their charge home, maybe along with ancient alien treasure. Now here is the next entry of David Drake's The Sea Without a Shore. Chapter 6 Bergen and Associates Shipyard Cinnabar A shipyard crew was replacing the Kaisha's high-drive nacelles under Mon's direction. A wrench made the hull ring with a burst of impacts. Adele supposed she should think of Mon as manager instead of lieutenant as she continued to do. She smiled mentally. For all that Mon's present was one of plump success, she suspected that he still considered an RCN officer to be of higher rank than a wealthy businessman. Another team from the yard was replacing the original purging system of the Kaisha's plasma cannon with a much higher capacity unit salvaged from a four-inch gun. Son, Daniel's longtime gunner, was on the bridge to oversee the work. The workman didn't appear to need much oversight, and Sun, to his credit, wasn't interfering. The third group of workmen wore coveralls without markings and were upgrading the Kaisha sensor and commo suites. There were two women on the bridge and three men out on the hull. They came from Mistress San's organization. Adele hadn't bothered asking what their cover identities were. As expected, they didn't need any more help than those working on the plasma cannon did. Adele was nonetheless present. Like Sun, she was keeping her mouth shut. Because the bridge was crowded by men who had removed an access plate to repipe the purging system, it squirted liquid nitrogen into the cannon between shots, cooling the bore. And by the women who were working on the command console, Adele was at one of the workstations at the rear bulkhead. Sun stood at the other, but he wasn't watching the flat plate display. He turned to Adele and said, do you know what they're doing to your rig on the hull, mistress? Not really, said Adele, looking up to the man standing beside her. As much as they can without it being externally obvious, I suppose. I'm not a hardware expert, as you know. She didn't suggest that he talk to the crew doing the work, because she knew they wouldn't tell him anything. She wasn't sure they would tell her anything beyond, I'm afraid you'll have to ask Mistress Sand, your ladyship. Son. A close-cropped man in his early thirties had the skill and experience to be gunner on a battleship. His formal rank on the Princess Cecile was gunner's mate, because corvettes like the Sissy had no slot for the exalted rank of gunner. As for tramp freighters like the Kaisha, in the rare instance when they had to fight it out with a pirate, the captain would probably control the gun. Did Six ask you to look over this installation, son? Adele asked. No, ma'am, he didn't. Son said with an unexpected look of concern. I heard from a buddy here in Yard that Six, well, Captain Leary, he said, was fitting out a ship and they was fitting a bigger gun. He gestured to the bow. Which they're not, you know, but for lots of things, a 50 millimeter is better than a four inch if it cycles fast enough, which it does with this rig. Nobody's going to be shooting missiles at a tramp like this, right? I don't imagine they will, Adele said, answering out of politeness. She had no more knowledge or concern about the question than she did on what the must-have fashion accessory for the season's debutantes was. If a missile, tons of metal moving at a measurable fraction of light speed, squarely struck the Kaisha or even a battleship, everybody aboard would be vaporized. There was nothing a signals officer could do to prevent that from happening, so Adele didn't think about the possibility. If it happened, she would be beyond all care. Well, anyway, I dropped by the yard to watch, Sun said. He frowned and then blurted. Ma'am, you don't think Six plans to leave me behind, do you? Because, well, he didn't call me before he started this. He gestured again. I don't know what Six intends for crew, Adele said carefully, because she really didn't know. This business, she turned up her right hand. The antennas and the rest of it, they were decided less than 24 hours ago. That I can tell you of my own knowledge. Sun sighed with obvious relief. Well, maybe he just didn't have time, he said. Though, ma'am, when you see him, you'll put in a good word for me, won't you? I won't let you down, I swear it. You never have in the past, son, Adele said truthfully. She didn't answer the precise question, however. 
She would no more interfere with Daniel's decisions on personnel than she would try to plot a course through the Matrix. Ah, son, she said, since the gunner clearly wanted to talk. A ship like this doesn't carry a dedicated gunner, of course. I would think that even in peacetime you could find a place with much higher status. Higher than sailing with six, ma'am? Son said. That's a joke. Why, I'll bet there's not a gunner on a battleship, senior warrant officer or not, who's earned a quarter as much as I've made from prize money sailing on the sissy. He grinned ruefully and said, Mind, it didn't stick to my fingers very well, but that'd be true of battleship pay too, for me at least. And status? That's not something you buy with florins anyway. Ma'am, I'm a sissy, and there's not an RCN bar on Cinnabar where they won't buy me free drinks for as long as I can lift my arm to pour them down. One of the workmen installing the purging system turned. He was a grizzled, heavyset man with an artificial left foot. Amen to that, spacer, he said, then went back to tightening a clamp. Adele remembered that the fellow's name was Hodson, a tech two who'd lost his foot when a broken line swung a stellite thruster nozzle wide as it was being replaced. That was on Sexburga years before. I wasn't thinking of them as people, Adele realized. She had been talking to Sun as though the others on the bridge were images on a display. Sun cleared his throat. Very possibly to turn the subject away from a disturbing one to which only Daniel could give an answer, he said. What's that you're looking at, ma'am? She's not the Kaisha, is she? Adele glanced at the flat plate display. She had been accessing the main console through her personal data unit, but the bulkhead display was echoing the data she had called up. No, she said. She switched to an external viewpoint, a harbor control camera. This is the Madison Merchant in Portinga Harbor. An acquaintance of mine was thinking of sailing on it. I decided to see what sort of ship it was while I'm waiting here. You could read the diagnostics board of a ship in Portinga Harbor? Sun said in amazement. Yes, said Adele. She didn't add. You're seeing the data, so obviously I can do that. Sun was a good man and a shipmate and he was quite skilled in his own specialty. Sun frowned at the real-time image of the ship. Ma'am, could you flip back to the diagnostics, he said. Yes, said Adele, doing so with a minute twitch of the wand in her left hand. Is something wrong? Ma'am, with a tramp freighter, it'd be a miracle if there wasn't something wrong, said the gunner. Right here, though. He looked at Adele with an expression of great concern. Ma'am, he said. I don't know how good a friend this guy is, but if you care about him, I'd say you ought to tell him not to ship aboard this Madison merchant. There's a lot of things about a ship that you got to eyeball. Computers won't tell you how much metal's left on the thruster nozzles or the wear on the high drive motors, but look at the pumps here. Adele followed Sun's pointing finger. It appears to say 15% flow, she said. But the ship is sitting in harbor, so it's just keeping the reaction mass tanks topped off, isn't it? Doesn't most of the water go straight back into the harbor? Right, right, said Sun. That's the flow. But you're not looking at the pump output up here, see? A moment, please, Adele said crisply. Even with Sun pointing again, it took her a moment. The data captions weren't meaningful to her. This one? She highlighted a line. 83%? That's it, said Sun. Anything over 80% is in the red zone, and they're only managing 15% flow from that output. Ma'am, it's not just that it's crap performance, it means that the pump's failing. Pretty quick it's going to quit dead, and where are you then if you're landing the sorts of places that a ship like this one lands? The little gunner drew himself up with a look of moral outrage, like a priest objecting to the sinfulness of the times. That was my specialty before I struck for gunner, you know, ma'am, he said. Tech 2, fluid system specialty. I did not know, Adele said, switching back to the external view of the freighter. I assure you, I will inform my friend in the strongest possible terms that he should not travel aboard the Madison Merchant. As indeed I have already done, Adele thought, as she closed the connection. That was another entry in our complete audiobook serialization of The Sea Without a Shore by David Drake. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com and to podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. 
and a multi-hued meteor shower, 15 salvos from a railgun firing confetti at supersonic speeds, and the thanks and praise of space and techno thriller buffs everywhere to Les Johnson, co-author with Travis S. Taylor of On to the Asteroid. Please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy, and keep reaching for the stars.